Hello everyone, the news of Ukraine agency is on the air. This is our international TV project, The World to Know, about the war in Ukraine, nuclear threats from Belarus and today specifically about the rapture of the Russian Federation. My guest today published the book Failed State. The Jamestown Foundation in Washington DC, where he works as a senior fellow, has translated his book into Ukrainian and made it available for free download. Welcome, Mr. Bogaisky. Hello, Oleg. Yeah, thank you for inviting me on the show. I'm coming to Ukraine next end of next week. Uh, my book launch. At what time? Uh, the dates in Kiev, I think it's uh, something like 8th to 10th or 11th, something like that. I'm also going to be in Lviv and, and Rivne, my family uh, hometowns. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm doing a book launch, so I'm in the hands of my publishers in terms of interviews and presentations and so forth. But I will be in Kiev for a few days. Janusz Bugajski has served as a consultant on East European Affairs for the US Agency for International development, the United States Department of Defense, the International Republican Institute, BBC Television in London, and now Mr. Bugajski is broadcasting from Washington DC on our international TV project, The World to Know. Janusz, you have uh, the great experience of international uh, relations and uh, you are now in Washington. Can I ask you about the position of the United States? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, over the past year there have been voices uh, among some politicians that we shouldn't be um, giving all this money, billions of dollars for military assistance. I don't think they understand exactly how this works in terms of military assistance, uh, how it actually helps the, the defense industry here in the United States. Part of the fear, I think, is that we're so focused on Ukraine that we won't be in a position to defend Taiwan. Uh, if and when China attacks Taiwan. I think it's a, still a small element uh, or a restricted element, particularly within the Republican Party. Look, the majority of the Republican Party, particularly almost every senator, uh, which is a very important institution, the Senate, uh, supports assistance aid, military aid for Ukraine. In fact, there are some Republicans that are, that are criticizing uh, the Biden administration for not supplying sufficient sufficient weapons fast enough uh, and weapons like long-range uh, missiles and F-16s that Ukraine needs in order to defeat the Russian forces as soon as possible. We are hearing now too many different uh, opinions from the United States about the war in Ukraine. Janusz, I ask you as a person who has a great experience in the international relations. If you look at public opinion, actually, uh, recent public opinion polls, over 60% of the population uh, fully support uh, military assistance for Ukraine. I don't think that's going to diminish. And the more successful Ukraine is in driving out Russian forces from occupied territories, I think the more they will be, uh, the more they will be seen as being successful and U.S. policies being successful. I mean, I've criticized this administration, um, not for giving aid, but for not giving aid fast enough. I remember a year ago, soon after the, or 14 months ago, soon after the, the full scale invasion began, a lot of us uh, here in Washington were calling for many more weapons for Ukraine. All the weapons they, they now have acquired should have been supplied very much earlier in the conflict. And then I think the war would have been over much quicker. Uh, this is the problem of incrementalism. This is the problem of fearing uh, the Kremlin. Um, this is true Russophobia. This is fear of of, of so-called escalation, a fear of um, provoking, you know, the word that we keep hearing, provoking the Kremlin. But this is ultimately nonsense. Ukraine has proven that there is nothing to fear. If you fully arm um, the armed forces, train them, put them in place, give them proper commanders, proper tactics, proper strategy, then the Ukrainian forces can win. Mr. Bugajski, in the previous interview, you didn't call yourself uh, a Russophobe, but a Russophile. And uh, the collapse of Russia is a good thing, which will help the peoples living there at least to preserve themselves and at most to become full member of the world community. Yeah, let me first of all explain why Moscow uses the idea of Russophobe. Uh, they're trying to depict anybody that opposes Moscow's imperial policy and genocidal policy as being a racist, a racist against Russia, which is actually absolute nonsense. Um, I have no racist views and Ukrainians don't have any racist views towards Russians. It's the Russians that have racist views towards the outside world. That is the problem. 
uh, I also Rossophobia tends to indicate irrational fear. I mean, uh, as a Pole, <laughs> I have no fear of Russia, um, and uh, and and my sense about Russia, my my analysis of Russia is not based on the irrational. So the term is irrelevant. Um, I joke about Russophilia that uh, we prefer to see many Russias. The Russian Federation should not disintegrate or fragment, but exactly rapture, completely and without return. For a clear understanding of this definition, he uses this special term rapture. This term rapture uh, allowed to identify who is the agent of Kremlin. Is it so? Yeah, I would say that the reason I use rupture is because it encapsulates the, the complex processes that are going on that will result in not just the fragmentation, but really the end of the Russian Empire. It's finally going to, to splinter, to collapse, and never to return. I mean, this is the, this is the sense I'm giving the term rupture. In other words, this is it's almost like the final phase, final imperial phase. And as you know, Moscovite uh, empire has gone through various phases, Muscovy, Tsarism, communism, Sovietism, Putinism. Now I think the rupture means that all that accumulated imperial uh, aggrandizement and, and acquisition, you know, Russia hasn't been able to transform itself into a democratic state, into uh, an ethnic state. It's even failed as, a, as an empire, as, we, as we're seeing with the collapse of the Soviet Union and now the coming collapse of the Russian Federation. Russia, the way it exists now, the size, the pretensions to neighbors, the stealing of identity, stealing of territory, destruction of, of uh, people and property that they cannot acquire. This is symptomatic, I think, of a dying empire, an empire on its last legs. And, and Ukraine, I think, is doing the whole world an incredible favor, an incredible service that I don't know if we'll ever be able to, to repay Ukraine for what it's doing now in not only standing up to this empire, but in helping to make it rupture. All Ukrainians and I think the world, the whole world are waiting for Russia to rupture as soon as possible, but so far we have the rupture of our country by Russian missiles. <laughs> At 4 a.m., the Russian aggressor launched a missile attack on the peaceful Ukrainian town of Uman, known worldwide for its Jewish monuments. The X-101 missile hit not a military target, but an ordinary residential building with hundreds of citizens who were peacefully sleeping at the time. As a result, the entire entrance hall was destroyed, killing 16 individuals, including three children injuring 18 residents, nine of whom remain hospitalized, and rescuing 17 people, including three children. They are brutally killing sleeping Ukrainian women and children sit down and uh, beheading Ukrainian soldiers with a knife right in the front of the camera lens. I think you have seen this horrible video. Is that a genocide? Uh, in answer to your question, clearly yes, it is genocide. Uh, the regime in Moscow uh, f is following in the footsteps of previous regimes, whether communist or, or, or tsarist, uh, basically to eliminate Ukraine as a nation, as an identity, as a state, uh, as well as Ukrainian history, its heritage and so forth. We've seen this for many, many generations. And Putin's regime is simply the latest manifestation of eliminating uh, the Ukrainians, uh, the Ukrainian ethnicity, the Ukrainian nation. So I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, all the methods that you that you've outlined. There are many others: kidnapping children, uh, this re-education process, um, um, it, it, it tortures, imprisonment, uh, destroying literature, burning libraries. I mean, this is all part of a ploy by Moscow to commit genocide against Ukraine in front of everybody's eyes. This is this is the amazing thing. In the old days, they used to hide it. You know, under communism, they hid the Holodomor. And now they're not even hiding this. They're, they're perpetrating an open genocide. Janusz, what do you think about the reasons of this genocide? The reasons, and I outline this in my book, is the fact that Russia itself uh, has a very brittle and uncertain identity. 
I think they look upon, in a way, they look upon Ukrainians as their history. They've stolen so much from Ukraine, as you know, over the centuries, the religion, uh, the alphabet, uh, the, the, the identity, the statehood. Um, I think it's a, it's both a sense of insecurity, but also arrogance because they've been allowed to build up their military potential uh, over the years. So it's this sort of imperial complex based on a very weak identity and, and in, in a way an inferiority complex, I would say, towards Ukrainians. Mr. Bukowski, what do you think about the role of Belarusian uh, self-proclaimed president Alexander Lukashenko in this war? Lukashenko, uh, traditionally, I would say, since he came to power in the early 90s, has, has tried to stay in power. That's his main objective, uh, is to remain in power. Now, he has at different times moved slightly west. He has at different times tried a little bit of liberalization in the country. But as soon as that threatens his power, he moves to quash any dissent. And we saw this in the elections in 2020, after the August elections, which he clearly lost. I think since the war began, he's moved much closer to, to Russia. Uh, whether he's completely under Moscow's control, I'm not 100% sure. He has uh, obviously uh, participated in the war against Ukraine. There's no doubt he's co-responsible uh, for, for allowing Belarusian territory, territory to be used in the attacks on Ukraine. But thus far, he has not used uh, Belarusian troops. Uh, he, has, he has not allowed direct involvement in the conflict against Ukraine. I think he is waiting for a time when um, maybe he knows as well as we do that at some point Russia will rupture and that he would then have an opportunity to reclaim Belarus as a fully independent state. This is what I think he's probably banking on at the back of his mind. But in the meantime, he has to go along and he does go along. Uh, with this Putin agenda, with this Putin um, narrative uh, that Russia is still a great power and that Belarus is somehow threatened. Whether he will survive Russia's rupture is another big question, because there are democratic forces in, in Belarus, as we've seen over the past few years, that may use that opportunity not only to distance themselves from a uh, collapse in Russia, but also to get rid of the dictatorship of Alexander uh, Lukashenko. More than 300,000 uh, citizens have left their native country, Belarus, and now their main journalistic uh, organization, Belarusian Association of Journalists, was liquidated. It's more than 1,300 journalists in Belarus. Uh, 35 our colleagues are in the jail now. 25 years of prison. For what? Well, precisely for what? To keep uh, Lukashenko in power to prevent any opposition, because he's obviously fearful that journalists and, and activists uh, and, and, and political alternative in, in Belarus has a lot of support. And that support will rise. Lukashenko has been in power for longer and has been the dictator of Belarus for longer than Putin. But I think Putin isn't just learning from Lukashenko. He's learning from Milosevic. He's learning from Stalin. He's learning from other dictators, uh, former Soviet and Russian dictators. Uh, what Putin does, he accumulates and assimilates uh, different ideologies, different methodologies to try and control the country. Um, Lukashenko is, uh, of course, in terms of his personalistic rule, in terms of his um, uh, his appeal, if you like, to the common man, um, his popularity, even though it's limited, it's, it's there's still there among a certain segment of the Belarusian population, those that lean more towards Russia. So in, in those respects, I would say there are some similarities. But I do actually think Lukashenko is smarter than Putin. I think Putin has got himself in such a mess he won't be able to get out. We're not yet sure whether Lukashenko is going to survive this. And this depends on what you said, on the democratic opposition, both inside and outside the country in Belarus. 
Belarus to make sure that when the empire falls, that Belarus has finally a democratic government that can move into Western institutions, including NATO and European Union. I think what's very important, maybe it's not done enough, is to get the word out to Belarusian people as well as Russian people that this regime in Moscow will collapse. And then Belarus will face a major crossroads uh, to distance itself finally from Russia and to move west and to distance itself and oust a, a government that is not fairly elected and to have real democratic elections finally so the Belarusian people can finally make a choice just as the Ukrainian people did exactly where they belong and who their rulers are. Thank you very much. We have the interview with Janusz Bugajski. is the senior fellow of the Jamestown Foundation from the United States of America. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank you, Oleg. Thank you very much.